Welcome to episode 49 of the XRM Toolcast. In this episode, Scott and I interview Mark Carrington, a brand spanking new MVP going on day five at the time of this recording and creator of the SQL for CDS tool for the XRM Toolbox. Mark has been on previously, but has done a whole bunch of improvements to the SQL for CDS tool, so we thought we'd sit and chat about it. So sit back and relax, and let's get started. Hello and welcome to another episode of the XRM Toolcast with me, your host, Daryl, always raising the bar, and my co-host, Scott. I'm a new, I'm more Canadian than Brit now. Daryl, how is it doing, Scott? Nah, it's good, Daryl. How are you? Good. So you've been you've been to Canada for like like how long? Have you picked up some of the accent? You got a few more A's in there? No. 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 no, no you don't go hang out like with that. with no. any of the. No, not allowed to hang out with anyone. <laughs> You're not allowed to hang out with anyone. <laughs> Dolman doesn't check no, you out over a... there. Anything? No. It's it's quite it's quite strange. You're kind of moving moving into a new area in the middle of a global pandemic because all your neighbors are sort of like just stay back, stay back. Normally it'd be like, oh yeah, well welcome, a quarter, neighbor. Yeah. A quarter of the way across the world for you is a new area. I'm moving into a new area. <laughs> I moved uh, yeah. five miles across town. I consider that a new area. But for you, <laughs> countries, continents across the, across the ocean. Yeah, well you know every, everything's virtual these days, so everything seems to be. Yeah, it's just it's no difference really. Where you and we all stay in touch with each other, you know, in these yeah. sort of things. So it's great. Um, but yeah, doing well, doing well. Um, yeah. Uh, so it was May the fourth. So the fourth be with you yesterday. Yes, Star yes, Wars our Day. Star Wars um, Day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I said that to all my children. They all just rolled their eyes at me and walked away. Uh, <laughs> so at, at some point over the last few years, that's just become a dad joke, you know. And every, all the kids are just like. Please. Oh, uh, <laughs> I still found that hilarious when he worked out, but it took a few minutes. <laughs> yeah. But I, I received a very cool bit of, bit of um, post today, actually, at my new address. Uh, for, and I got a sticker from PowerWiki. Uh, okay. So yeah, it was a right, handwritten new, letter, though, like even. Absolutely, from my a new new sticker from my laptop, which is uh, very exciting. So yeah, because I did a contribution on PowerWiki, which was uh, which is if you haven't checked it out, it's awesome. Awesome job. Um, lots of good information there. Awesome. Um, of course, it was Embass as well this week. Uh, did you check yeah. out Embass? I I did not. I I am um, I have a hard time checking out a lot of the things in the middle of the work week or even at the end of the work week because I have yeah, other stuff yeah. going on. But uh, did, did, what did I miss out on? Well, you can just I was just about to say if you didn't, you can check out the Up podcast with uh, you know because you know they always come up with. I checked them out a lot. Yeah. I've actually communicated them the side because I found out about uh, Poldark, that um, 1700s British uh, uh, show thing, um, and, and, and thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah. And they always make recommendations or thing to watch. I was like, why didn't you guys mention Poldark earlier? So anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, like, yeah I love the, the Lisa's and uh, Megan's TV recommendations. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm the same as well. But uh, the other stuff's important as well, yeah. Yes. yes. All right. All right. So let's we let's, don't uh, let's to the end. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Let's uh, let's get forward in, or forward. Let's fast forward to introducing our, our guest here. Yeah, we've we've been studiously ignoring Mark. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> very good. No, very good at ignoring ignoring him. But um, those that are on the uh, that are listening to to this through a podcast via uh, rather than. Uh, to YouTube, uh, would have no idea who this is, but um, we uh, have in, now have uh, our guest today as Mark Carrington, uh, second time on, um, and we are in day five of Mark being an MVP. So, uh, just a bitty baby MVP. Do you take frequent naps in the afternoon and wake up in the middle of the night crying? Oh, I, I need to, yeah. So. <laughs> I, I'm getting um, alert overload at the moment, so uh, yeah, just, uh, <laughs> trying to find my feet and uh, see how it all working out. But yeah, okay. it's, uh, it's been yeah a crazy few days. How does it feel to be a you know an influencer? Because you know <laughs> that's basically it's kind of the equivalent of having a little blue tick to your name now. That, that's yeah, do I get one of those now as well? Yeah, I, I mean, you should do surely, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I just, to be honest, just for full disclosure, I've got no idea what the blue tick next to your name is. So it means it's, it's just... really your name. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> what difference that makes, I have no idea. But <laughs> all 
right. All right. So last time you're on, Mark, we brought you on to talk about the sequel for CDS. This time we're bringing you on to talk about it again because you, you've, um, to put it lightly, you've upped your game, I think, right? Yeah, I think so. You've, you, you've made lots of improvements. You haven't changed the name yet, which you know, Jonas will probably be angry about, but uh, <laughs> but I know, me with me, my stuff, I haven't changed any of my name stuff, so so I, I can't complain too much. But um, so uh, let's let's back up a little bit and why don't you get a little history, you know, short two-minute introduction of what SQL for CDS is, and then we can kind of dive into what have you been working on and changing and, and was it worth it and what can you do with it now? How about those two things? Yeah, so um, SQL for CDS started, I released the first version about a year and a half ago now, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, mostly, I didn't like writing Fetch XML and I worked with SQL a lot in my day job. Um, I don't think anyone apart from Jonas likes writing Fetch XML. Um, so, um, yeah, I thought I could probably do something here, translating SQL to Fetch XML. Um, and yeah, I sort of went down a little bit of a rabbit hole. Um, so, and uh, yeah, I, I managed to get it sort of converting a, you know, select name from account into a, a Fetch XML statement. And I can write that a lot quicker. And I could share that with the, the team at work that know SQL and don't know Fetch XML. Um, and it kind of grew from there, really. So then I started doing, you know, you can do bulk updates. Again, it's a, a lot quicker writing a, an update statement in SQL than it is to do massive updates through any of the out-of-the-box tools, I think. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, if you want to update, um, I don't know, if you want to go and inactivate all the accounts that haven't had any activity for the last six months, how would you do that out-of-the-box? I don't know. I haven't had any activities, uh, any activity in the last six months? Uh, is that like creating an Excel export and then updating and re-importing it? Like that's the best way I've got. Even that, I'd probably hack together something with the Excel sheet. Scott, you got a better answer? No, that sounds good to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so much of it, you have to export the data, you have to fiddle about with it in Excel. If you have to do it regularly, then that becomes a real pain. Um, so yeah, if you can just run a, an update statement in SQL, then um, yeah, it's it's one command and you can run it as many times as you want. So that's kind of where it grew from. Um, and I kind of, yeah, I released that. I thought you know, a few people might use it. And then before I know it, it's running you know, 1,000 queries a day, 2,000 queries a day. Um, before I know it, it's, it's, I think on, the, on average, it's running about, come to about three, four million queries a year. SQL CDS now, which is just nuts for something that I just did because fetch XML annoyed me. Um, and yeah, that's uh, that's where it, it got to. Then sort of start of this year, um, it kind of it started bugging me a bit that some of the things that I could do in SQL that I couldn't do with SQL for CDS because it tried to translate everything to fetch XML, and that's got some limits. And um, I think I just started. Like, um, sort of challenging myself. I don't know whether it's, hopefully it's useful to, to lots of the people as well, but you'd see people trying to use queries that it couldn't handle. Um, I think you came up with one, Daryl, on, on Twitter saying, you know, can you use unions with it? Um, I was like, no, you can't. Yeah, maybe it could. Yeah. No, that's too difficult. And then when it's, someone tells me that something's too difficult to be done, then that's just a, a red rag to a bull, you know, so you've got to, you've got to try it. So. I uh, went down the rabbit hole a bit further. And did you solve it then? So yeah, so the last sort of three, four months, I kind of pulled it all apart and put it back together again. So instead of trying to convert SQL to a fetch XML statement, it now can convert it to lots of them and try and put them back together. So it's doing a lot more of the query processing itself, or it can do. Um, so lots of trying to figure out how SQL Server does things, and yeah, learned a lot about SQL Server along the way as well. Um, and yeah, just trying to figure out you know, if you ask this query of SQL Server, how does it put all the data together? So how it does all the joins, the unions, the subqueries are an absolute nightmare. Um, but that's one of the things that I really see people wanting to use a lot. Um, mm -hmm. So if you're familiar with those, that, that can give you a lot of extra power. Okay, so when I did, um... When I made uh, kind of my own fetch XML, actually it was query expressions to, I did a link uh, provider 
for XRM uh, unit test back in the day. And having to write that hurt my head a lot, <laughs> uh, being able to apply these filters to different places and, and making sure that they were correctly in the right hierarchy and all that kind of stuff. And, and it was totally unlike any code I've had to write before um, or since, really. Has that been that case with this as well? It's like kind of getting your your mind in a whole, whole new different mindset to, to write that type of code? Or is it still pretty much the, kind of the same sort of thing you do on a day-to-day -day basis already? So it's, it's, it's not the only time I've done converting queries from one language to another. So, um, yeah, we do interface with a lot of other systems. So yeah, um, it's SQL is a nice language to use. Um, everybody knows it or a lot of people know it to, to some level. Um, so if you can start off with SQL and translate it to other things, then it just makes everyone's lives a lot easier. So I've done it to some extent for, for various systems now. Um, but this is by far the furthest I've ever taken it. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's been a learning experience, just understanding the sequel to that much extra depth, even without all the dynamic side of it. And you come across a lot of, um, sort of oddities within the, uh, the Dataverse platform, um, looking at the, the way particular fields work and the, the way some queries work and some queries don't work. Um, I've got a few blog, blog articles now on ways, just some queries that really look like they should work, just <laughs> not quite there. Uh, and there's all these little things you just got to keep in mind if you're used to just being able to run any SQL you want and it's, it just gives you the right answer. Um, some of the extra things you've got to keep in mind to, to get the results that you're expecting back from Dataverse is um, a little bit tricky. So um, I think I've found sort of three or four ways, if you just want to get a, a list of distinct results, the ways that can go wrong, it's um, a little bit surprising. You know the, um, the query optimizer? that you've mm. got is it, it's, it's, just just how 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 how, <laughs> how does this how, how did a how do you do that you know <laughs> and and b how can you you know how do you kind of understand enough about what's going on with a sql query to be able to then understand the, the various different ways you can optimize it and then feed it into fetch xml or the td mm. uh, tds endpoint i mean it probably helps that you know i think the first like official training that I ever went on after university was a, a, a SQL server, um, uh, like performance course back in 2002, three, something like that. So I've, I've kind of been used to using this for a lot of years now. Um, but actually if you kind of, if you break the SQL apart into its steps, it does kind of flow quite logically. So. Thankfully, Microsoft produced a library to actually parse the SQL in the first place. So that's kind of that bit done. You know, I give it some text and it says, okay, you've got a select statement and you've got a, that's got a from clause and that's got a join, which has got a table and another table. And then you've got yeah. a where clause. Whatever. Is that like a SQL down parser then? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So you, so you get, it's actually called um, script DOM. So you, you get the, the object model of, of the SQL. And then you just got to go through it in a logical order, which is completely back to front and how you actually write SQL in the first place. So yeah, starting from the from clause, okay, right, we've got two tables and we've got a join between them. So, okay, I'm going to start off saying I need one fetch XML to get all the data from this table. I'll get another fetch XML to get all the data from this table. And then I need some sort of join between the two. And then I've got a where clause. So I need to put some sort of filter on the results of that. And then I've got a, an order by, so I need to put a, a source on the results of that. And then I'm wanting these three columns from the select clause. So we're going to put another node on the front of that to just get the columns I want. So that gives you a really basic kind of model of how the execution flow goes. But that's going to be really inefficient because that's loading everything from two tables and then doing everything in memory. So then it's, okay, how much of this can we actually push down to some more efficient fetch XML? So, okay, let's have a look at the join. Is the join something that fetch XML supports. Okay. So join just on two columns being equal. We can fold that into one fetch XML. Okay. It's great. We've got one fetch XML there. So next comes the filter is the filter something that we can apply to it. So the plenty of filters that you can do in fetch XML, but there's also a lot more that you can do in SQL that you can't. So can we, how much of that can we pull out and push down into fetch XML? So you start off with this really sort of naive 
inefficient execution plan of basically do, loading all the data into memory and then doing all the processing in memory. And then kind of starting from the, the source side, the, the actually loading data in and joining it and then working towards the, the end. How much of that can you keep stuffing into the fetch XML? And what you're left with is, is what actually needs to be executed within the tool at the end. But hopefully you've offloaded as much processing as you can do into the, uh, the, the fetch XML file. Less by, less bits over the server. Yeah. I remember when I was, uh, <laughs> I was on my second job out of college and they had a old flat file storage system database type thing and it was storing the products at stores and i wanted to say give me all the products at this store because i needed to print off price tags for all the products they had at that store it took longer to query this database with the filter than just to return all the products at all the stores <laughs> so I just returned all the products with all the stores. Um, and I will say it's the only project I've ever been on where they actually went from that flat file system and they switched over to Oracle of all things like a real database. And so I just switched that one. I mean, I just had one basically select star from whatever query and, and it, there was no changes really to make. It was like a 10 minute deal to change from one database to another because everything else was in memory. Now, if I had time, should it have actually been rerun so everything was done against Oracle? Yes, but there wasn't time yeah. to do that. But yeah, yeah, yeah I can see, I can feel feel the that whole idea of downloading everything and just doing it all in memory. I mean, you can go really, really fast once you get it all local, that's for sure. <laughs> well, that, I mean, that's the thing about indexing, right? Because I think, well, for me, the, the, SQL, uh, the, the, the SQL query optimizer is, that's probably its biggest job is to decide on the mm -hmm. best approach to the which best indexes to use what hash ta table kind of algorithms but of course you, you, we're so separated from all of that you know that we we don't even know if it's sql anymore i mean it, we <laughs> assume it is but as far as you know we would have be we, we could be querying some you know json database for for all we can because we, we're we're isolated so i i guess you know the, the query optimization you're doing you have to kind of have some uh, opinion about the best ways of querying data and, and you have to sort of say well this is the way that fetch works or this is the way the tds endpoint works so therefore i'm gonna do you have to optimize it in that way so my optimization is yeah it's uh it's a world away from all those decisions that real sql servers got to make because you say we don't have any of that information um even if we have the information we don't have a way of accessing the data in any different way um, it's fetch or nothing pretty much. Um, so my optimization is get as much of the query into the fetch XML as possible, and then I'll handle the rest reasonably naively. Um, so yeah, I've got three different join operators. So that's as, as far as taken that one. So you can do merge joins, hash joins, and nested loop joins like you can in SQL. Um, but it will use those if the, there is kind of, uh, an ordering of how efficient those are, but equally uh, merge join is easily more efficient, but um, it's more restrictive when you can use it. So yeah. I'll just use the uh, the most efficient one of those overall, but yeah, there's uh, you know, there's nothing in the way of you know, query statistics and, and stuff like that. So um, actually for some of them, um, I need to make sure that you don't destroy your API limits for example, and yeah. subqueries yeah. is a, a good way to easily do that. Um, <laughs> Just every single row doing another yeah. query. For every, if you have a subquery that, yeah, for every row you need to run a subquery and you've got you know, 10,000 rows in there, then you just use your daily API limit. Um, yeah. So there are, there is one optimization where I, I kind of, I need to get some statistics to, to figure out the best way of doing that. Um, so uh, I just use like the size of the table and then a, a few sort of heuristics to say, okay, if you've got 10,000 accounts, but actually you've got some filters on some of those, then actually maybe there's only a hundred records coming in. So is it more efficient to do a hundred subqueries or is it more efficient to load that entire other table and do the subqueries then in memory? Mm -hmm. Do you, cause you uh, collect statistics. I know on your website, you've got like a, a Power BI report. Mm -hmm. Is that, do you actually collect the number of queries that are being executed against the API for each user? Because I mean, I'm, what I'm getting at is, could you could send an email, say, uh, 
By the way, you're exceeding your uh, your API usage for this for today using my tool. <laughs> Isn't that we send it send it to Microsoft to say, hey, I'm I'm consuming all these all these uh, stuff. Maybe you should give me a little kickback here because now, now I'm to, <laughs> yeah, I'm using to it buy more, limits, but... increase their limits. <laughs> So um, yeah, so I, I'm just tracking how many queries in total um, people are running, um, and sometimes you'll see crazy spikes in there where people do you know, tens of thousands of update requests in one day. Where I guess they've just done an export to Excel and they've done that thing in Excel where you generate a SQL statement for each row and copy and paste it back in. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's massively inefficient. They do that. But if I did, uh, if I went say update. Um email address equals uh, test uh, at test.com and, and had no where clause and I get back, you know, five billion rows affected. Um, that presumably means I'm using five million API code calls. Yeah. Uh, plus the ones to, to get the IDs of the ones you want to update. So yeah. So that's the last thing. That's the first thing you do. You know, when, whenever you start working with SQL, you know, everyone goes through a rite of passage about doing an update statement and forgetting yeah, the where clause. The difference is, though, it goes through an awful lot quicker at, at uh, SQL Server than it does when you're, you're writing back to Dataverse. So you get plenty of chance to hit the stop button. Oh, you mean running over and <laughs> yeah, pulling the ethernet plug out of cats. the wall doesn't work anymore? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With SQL, it's gone. The, the <laughs> query's off into the wild. You know, you can turn your computer yeah. off. <laughs> that's, that's hit me so many times, actually, for different things that one of the very first things I did when I put in the update and delete is it pops up a message to say, this is going to update 5,000 rows. Are you sure you want to continue? I did, I did see it's, that. Uh, yeah. And at first I was like, oh, that's yeah. annoying. But I really, I'm going to need it. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to turn that one off. <laughs> I'm going to want it. And it's where you're, are you sure? Yes. Are you really, really sure? Yes. Are you <laughs> just click, absolutely stop, stop positive? Clicking the yes button without reading the message. <laughs> what is the middle name of your second child born on a Tuesday? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Actually, I love that about when you, you know, when you go and try and delete a, a, a branch in, in, uh, in GitHub or, or you try and delete something in, in Dataverse, you know, it asks you to type in the name of the environment or, or the branch, you know, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's just, <laughs> just type in the number of records that you're expecting this to affect. Yeah, type in the period of the record you actually want to delete. Yeah. Do you yeah, think this yeah. is gonna that that should be the that should be the box? Do you think this is gonna affect from zero to one hundred, hundred to a thousand, or a thousand yeah. to ten thousand, or more? Like, <laughs> so you got to give it a number, and if you're not right, it it's not gonna run it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I got to the point. Yeah, yeah, I was doing a load of updates, and it was quite annoying. So you sort of set set the uh, the warning limit. So yeah, only warn me if it goes if it's gonna delete more than one record or update more than one record. And yeah, it just it ran the update, it ran the update, it ran the update, and suddenly it said, oh, it's going to update two records. It's like, oh, that's interesting. Mm. Why is that? <laughs> so yeah, that's that saved me a few times. Eh? Yeah. No, I mean, that's the thing is with, with, with updates and inserts, it's just a, it's just such a killer tool because, you know, I, I, I've used it and it, it, to do it in any other way would just would be, you know, you'd just be doing so much mm. other stuff. Whereas with just cracking this, you know, the... the SQL CDS is just do those update statements. Like you say, I mean, I've done the same thing with an Excel spreadsheet, generated a load of records, uh, insert statements. Yeah. Um, and actually, I've not tried it yet, but I, I've noticed that one of the supported functions is new sequential ID um, in the TDS effort. Uh, yeah. So uh, have you, because I, I mean, that's one of the challenges with inserting records, right? If you want to do an in deep insert, you can do that through the web API where it automatically relate child records to a parent record. Yeah. You have to worry about the IDs. But obviously one of the challenges is when you insert a load of records, if you were then you want to go and insert child records, you need to get back the GUIDs of those records that you've just inserted. Um, and and the TDE and the TDS endpoint has got the new set sequential ID, which I'm guessing creates a GUID in the same way as the dataverse would do natively. Otherwise, I can't imagine why they put it in there. Um, have you have you ever tried to but do anything you can't like that? Do inserts through the TDS endpoint? So no, no, um, indeed. So if you used it to get because it's the standard SQL function, yeah. So I mean, yeah. have you have you thought about that in terms of like how you would create? Say, if I wanted to create a, a lot of accounts and then go and create some child contacts without having to worry about getting the GUIDs back, is is that something you thought about trying to solve? Yeah. So I've thought. Um, 
it would be nice to be able to support variables. Um, so you can you know, declare some variables and use them later on. But equally, if you're getting those variables, you could then use the um, maybe the at at identity variable, and that could give you the GUID that's just been inserted. It's, uh, it's not quite what it means in you know, in SQL. That would just be a, an integer rather than a GUID, but it can take a little bit of license, I think. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, so you could, you could have one insert, get that ID back, stick it in a variable, and use that for all your child record inserts as well. Um, yeah, I think that would be useful. No, that, that would be that would be fantastic. This tool has been around for just just over a year. Do you want to guess, Mark, uh, how how it stacks as far as the most rated plugin? What 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 is the rank is, at the number of ratings it has received? Number of ratings. Um, yeah. No, it's um, and I'll give you I'll give you a hint. Fetch Fetch XML Builder is at thirty. That's the number one rated the, the tool with the most ratings. So where do you think the um, SQL for CDS? I would guess somewhere between five and ten. Okay, so you think it's got five and ten rating, ratings, or think mm -hmm. it's number five or number ten? I think it's got five to ten ratings. All right, and then what what number uh, do you think that is? Do you, do you think that's in the, a, a ranking of twentieth highest? No. What's the ranking of the tool? I, I, I it's going to be either really good or really bad, Darren. I mean, the way you will be with that. <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. If I said 40, that wouldn't be very interesting. It's 43. No, okay. So you're, you're at number eight. You're at number wow. eight. It's a four-way tie at number eight um, for, with 11, ra 11 ratings. So, yeah. I mean, Scott is, Scott is number three, actually number two at, at 15. So uh, hats off to Scott. Um, but also, is. you'll need to get out and rate your tools because if Ribbon Workbench has only got 15 ratings, then uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> he does have the most five star ratings, though. He, he is only yeah. five star ratings and 15 of them, so <laughs> they're all me, just you know. <laughs> <laughs> they're all you with junk email accounts. Yes, yeah, yeah, that happens. I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. So, in the docs, you know, there's like the, the thumbs up, thumbs down in the in the Microsoft docs thing. It's like ratings is something in IT, you know, we only say stuff when something's not good, right? So it, there's, there's this, this systemic problem where no one really goes, great job. That's a really good stuff. It, it's, it's, we only put comments when oh, it didn't work very well or I don't like that. You know, <laughs> we, we, as a community, I think we need to do more of this, like giving the positive as well as the negative. Uh, so I, I'm going to take it upon myself to do a lot more thumbing, thumbs up on stuff. Yeah, I, I think you know if you use a if you use a tool that so helps you on a project, and if you're using it on every project or most of your projects, then you know, just doesn't take very long. Just go and give it a, a rating on the, the toolbox, and yeah, it's hardly any time out of your day, is it? But share some love. Share some love. That can be the name of this episode. <laughs> share some love. There are people. Hey. Although people may not get what they're adver yeah, advertising. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, so last time we talked, Mark, you were doing a lot of the TDS direct stuff, and you had to have a certain uh, credentials in order to actually log into that. Um, but so that's still there in the tool, right? But now they're doing a lot more stuff just with the fetch XML stuff. Yeah. So if you've got the TDS endpoint enabled, then yeah, you can. If you run a select statement, it will just hit the TDS endpoint directly. Nothing more to do on that. Um, but you can also use that for the updates and inserts and deletes and stuff. So if you want to update some records, it can use the TDS endpoint to go and build the query to figure out what needs to be updated and to what. And then it will use the regular Dataverse API to actually do the updates behind the scenes. Um, but yeah, that's become a, a lot easier to turn on. Certainly, I think since last time we uh, last time we talked about it. Um, but I've also actually released a, a version of SQL for CDS that's a, a SQL Server Management Studio plugin. So if you're using SSMS to run the, your regular select queries against the TDS endpoint, you can now with that plugin installed, you can do your updates, inserts, deletes within SSMS as well. And the the plugin sort of detects what sort of query it is that you're running. If it's a select statement, it just does SSMS does its normal thing. If it's a update, insert, delete, then it takes over and uh, SQL Server uh, SQL for CDS does its thing, but within the SSMS process window. Hmm, that's now I need cool. to do it for the Azure Data Studio as well. Have you used that at all? <laughs> you know what that is? Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah I, I haven't really played with it because I do a lot of the the admin stuff that's more in SSMS yeah. um, yeah. rather than just running queries all day. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it certainly should be possible. But, um, <laughs> so if I did so, a if I did an update with a where clause, uh, so what you're saying is that it will go and do the select. It will go and get the data that needs to be updated using the TDS endpoint, yeah, and then go and do the the, the API uh, calls to do the updates. So yeah, so kind of did... getting this best of both worlds. Yeah, so to do an update in Dataverse, you you've got to do it record by record on an ID. So yeah, if you want to say um, update the uh, email address of all contacts with the first name of Mark. You, know, you update contact set email address equals test at test.com where first name equals Mark. What it will do behind the scenes there is create a select statement, which is select contact ID and Mark from contact where first name equals Mark. Um, and then it will run that query. So if it's using the TDS endpoint, it will use the TDS endpoint. If it's, if it's using fetch, it will create a fetch XML for that. And then it's got all the data it needs to then feed into the update process. So yeah, whatever it, whatever, you know, update, delete, insert you're doing, it's going to start off with creating a select statement for it to get the data. And then it does its uh, processing on the results of that. So, so it's quite a lot simpler, I think, than the, you know, all the stuff that SQL has to do behind the scenes there. Cause yeah, it's uh, just doing record by record. Not particularly efficient. If, say, if you're doing a, an update on five million records, there is no shortcut to that. You've got to do five million updates. <laughs> but it's uh, still a lot quicker to write an update statement and then just leave it running for a while. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Do you hit like? Do you have any kind of stuff that hits that detects if it hits the uh, service protection limits, and so it will do some kind of like backing off. So it's using the um, CRM service client, so it should do all that automatically. So um, fingers crossed that's yeah. all working. Yeah, it uses thread, thread dot sleep. Yeah. The cover, that's what it gives you. <laughs> so it's just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's them doing it, not me, so I don't have to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's just, just doing single threaded. Is that what's going on? Is it just does no, So you can, you've got some options there as well. So it will do it in, in batches. It will do it in multi threads. So you can tweak these things. Um, so I think by default it will do in 10 threads. Um, and uh, um, Matt Barber actually posted something recently to say there was an update to the Serum service client where we can expose this um, affinity cookie thing. So where we can uh, say actually because I'm doing massive numbers of really small updates, I want that to be spread across all the, the front end servers that's, that's there in the, the Serum instance. Um, so that's got to come through the next XRM toolbox version before I can start using that. But um, yeah, if you're doing massive bulk updates, that could be potentially quite a big performance boost as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think the, he was saying that the only the only reason why you might need a consideration is that is if you're doing any uh, metadata updates because yeah. of the the way in which because if you make a if you make a new attribute on an entity then they the way they cache it across multiple front front end nodes they invalidate the cache on the server that you made the change on but if you if you don't if you're not using an affinity cookie you might miss you might actually hit a different server that hasn't got the update to the metadata or something like that yeah so your case, getting, it's not yeah really, if you're missing data anymore. so it's um yeah just throw it through as far as fast as you can so yeah, I see you can't sort of turn that on for all the XRM toolbox tools because there's so many that do mess about with metadata in weird and wonderful ways. Would that yeah. could potentially cause a database locking issue among the servers, right? Because if you send all these updates to all these other servers, they're all trying to get locks on their own web servers. I, would that potentially be slower? Or have you already tested they're this? They're all getting no locked on individual rows, though. So okay. I would assume because the because the updates are for a particular row for row GUID, I would okay. guess that the SQL Server is going to take a lock just on that particular row. So the answer is no, Daryl. It wouldn't be an issue. <laughs> yeah, it depends what else. If if it's just that that's going on at the same time, then that's fine. But yeah, if you're doing big select statements as well, that's uh, they they could overlap. But we can just edit that out just to say no. <laughs> And then that'll say so. <laughs> <laughs> just have like a pre-recorded. There's no doubt. And then... yeah. 
<laughs> the, I remember in episode 27, you were talking about um, the, the, one of the, the problems was that a lot of people, you know, you couldn't update where one field was the same or greater than another field. I think, you know, you were talking about the, the modified on and the created on, you know, up, get where the two are different. Um, obviously, now that's available in Fetch XML now. So have you have you updated? So does it now use that new functionality for Fetch XML to do those kind of comparisons between different attributes in a way? Yeah, that's so available? it will use that where it can. Uh, and um, but it's I want it to be backwards compatible as well. So there are still people with old on-prem versions um, as much as we try and deny it. So uh, yes, it should detect based on the version that you've got whether it can use that or not, and then it will decide when, after it's built that initial kind of naive execution plan as it's trying to push those filters into the fetch XML and say, okay, I've got a, a column comparison here. Is that supported by the version I'm actually running this on? And then if it is, it will fold that into the fetch XML. If not, then it's going to do the uh, the more basic thing of just get all the data from the server and, and process that in memory. That's um, so cool. And so actually, cool. I'll do the same on, um, uh, I think, Daryl, you think you posted on Twitter again must be about a year ago now about these new join operators that magically appeared in the SDK one day. Yep. Um, the in and exists ones seem to be documented now. So yeah, for some sub queries that'll, that'll use those as well. But again, only for modern online versions. Yeah. Yeah. It must be like a full-time job keeping up with the, the, you know, all of the different things that are happening with the query language and, you know, trying yeah, to make it's, sure it's that. It's nice to see sort <laughs> of, I kind of assumed that that was kind of, it, it is what it is and it's not really going to change very much, but actually over the last year or so, there have been some, some good improvements. So yeah, the, the column comparisons you can do in and exists. There's some more undocumented properties that have magically appeared in query expression as well. Um, so it'd be interesting to see when those come along. Um, so yeah, sort of see them just appear in the, it's a, a property will just appear in the documentation with, with no text against it one time when I'm looking at it and then um, hopefully a few months later it'll, it'll actually be usable. So. I, I wonder how much kind of cross talk there is between the, 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 the TDS endpoint and the fetch XML if there's sort of because I, I think it, obviously the TDS endpoint obviously goes through a much more direct route or it mm -hmm. doesn't go through the fetch parser but I wonder how much they they talk between each other in terms of the teams because the TDS endpoint it's sort of gone quiet recently I mean there hasn't been so, so much, you know, other stuff going on about it. it yeah, so I'm surprised it's, it's still in it's still in preview for um, if you're using it through uh, SSMS. So you, it's supported from Power BI, but not if you're writing your own SQL query. So I'm not there's probably a reason for that, but I don't know what it is. Um, I wonder if Power BI can only produce a sort of a more limited set of queries that they're happier supporting at the moment, whereas. As I've learned, you can write some really crazy SQL queries, um, so they're not <laughs> quite ready to support all that just yet. Um, one thing I've noticed actually, though, when I've been testing, can you know, switch between running everything through fetch and running things through TDS endpoint? Is some of the tables that don't exist through the uh, TDS endpoint that you can get to through uh, through fetch. So I presume that's because they've been moved out of the SQL Server to some other storage mechanism. Um, but yeah, I wonder if there's some limitations there that people might sort of bump up against that um, it, it kind of sounds like you can just query all your data through SQL, but there are, you, know, you can query certainly most of your data through SQL with the TDS endpoint, but there are some limitations there that aren't obvious. Mm. I wonder if in the future, SQL will become more of a, a sort of like a, you know, a, a significant part of the platform from a plugin development, from a JavaScript, you know, side of things. Because at the moment, it is very much off in a, on a limb, isn't it? Over here. Yeah, so yeah, you can't use it from, from plugins, which is kind of annoying. Um, I'm not quite sure of the logic behind that. I'm sure there is some, but I'm not sure what it is. Um, but yeah, not being able to just just use it in the same way as everything else does make it a bit more limited. but. I really hope it does move forward because I, I I can't see any other system having that sort of native SQL um, capability. You know, if you go to any other CRM system, which of them are going to write 
a whole layer where you can just connect to it as if it's you know, an Oracle database, for example. Um, it's just not going to happen. So I think Microsoft have got a real unique thing here. Um, and I think it'd be a shame if they don't sort of push it that little bit further to, to sort of get it over the line. Yeah, definitely. Especially people moving from on-prem. You know, you can just... Because, like, and actually the updates as well, using your tool, because that's one of the things that, like, you know, the whole kind of, there's a lot of people that go, yeah, yeah, we just up, just run update statements against our on-prem. Yeah, I never did that. And, uh, <laughs> everyone else is like, wait, whoa, what are you doing? <laughs> They're like, yeah, what's the problem? It's just, <laughs> and then you go, yeah, we are, what, what is the problem? We're just updating a column. No, yeah, slap yourself. You know, don't go down that <laughs> route. <laughs> it's a slippery slope. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it was, um, we've only moved ourselves to online in the last, um, what, 10, 10 months or so. I think it was, uh, August, I think we moved to online finally, but we did a lot of reporting from SQL. Um, we would do sort of overnight, yeah, let's extract some data, um, do some processing on it. Um, that we probably, that, that was a blocker for us for a while for moving online. I probably could have done something similar using the data export service or something like that, but it always just felt like it's not quite as seamless as uh, whatever. It's just being able to query the data whenever you want, um, direct into uh, to the source system. Um, so yeah, being able to do that now, um, eventually we, we got rid of that, that requirement. So it wasn't such an issue anymore, but, um, yeah. If anyone that's doing that now on uh, on prem, you know, querying that SQL database, so there are still a few limitations on you know, some of those. Uh, the more sort of meta type entities that aren't there, um, you know, audit logs and stuff like that that aren't there. But you know, all your main business entities, yeah, it's just exactly the same as if you were querying it on prem. Really, the metadata is something that I would love to be able to query more easily. You know, just be able to. You know, grab grab all of the actually directly from the TDS endpoint. You know, if you could, if we could, if there was more support for the metadata, it, it would unlock a whole raft of tools. You know, like the ERD tools and things like that 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 had just been around for decades because you know that used to be what everyone did. Um, yeah, and that, that was one of the things I I built into SQL CDS actually because I I wanted to be able to the. Uh, um, Metadata tools, um, Metadata Explorer, I want to say, Technologies tool, um, Metadata Browser is, is great. But if I want to find, you know, all the, all the attributes that meet some criteria, I'm not just searching on name, I'm not searching in a, one particular entity. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of tricky. So yeah, one of the things I added six months or so ago now into SQL for CDS is being able to um, query entities, attributes, relationships, option sets. Um, but yeah, not within the TDS endpoint. Though, so. Yeah. So I wonder how that can, is, is that, I didn't realize you could do that. So you could, do you expo expose that as the SQL, uh, objects like the sys objects table? So I'm uh, doing it through, um, metadata dot something. So it's like a, a metadata okay. schema. Ah, okay. Right. Cause it's the, the, if we had that ability to query against the SQL objects, you know, the sys objects that, that store all the metadata that in a normal SQL server, that would unlock well, this whole raft of tools. Some of it must be there because the object explorer in SSMS must be reading that to, to get the list of tables, list of columns. Um, I don't know whether it goes as far as all the relationships, which you'd, you'd need for that sort of diagramming. Um, yeah. But yeah, there must at least be some there. Um, mm. But yeah, yeah so you can see it all in the left hand side, can't you? In the object explorers, like you say. Yeah. So. To me, the, the big thing about, you know, the, not just being able to query your data through SQL, but actually using the TDS protocol is that it should unlock all these other tools uh, that were already out there for you know, things like, you know, entity framework and is that. But yeah, if you've got a, a regular database diagramming tool, then yeah, why not have that? And yeah. It to the database? I tried connecting Visual Studio to it and it didn't work. <laughs> so Mark, I don't know what your plans are for this weekend, but here's what Scott wants you to do. You need to crack <laughs> open Fiddler, crack open a, a SQL Server Management Studio and see what what queries are being done to populate that stuff and then you recreate it just because Scott kind of wants it, sort of, yeah, at times. That's right. 
<laughs> like doing a podcast. Yeah, I mean, but it is it is one of those things, isn't it? The whole data, the whole visualization of, of entities and also tables now, even you know, now that they even call tables and columns, it, it's it's so much closer to what we used to do. So you know, like access, you know, that that would right back to the the early days. You know, it used to be access was a great tool for just visualizing your data structure against the SQL server, you just point access at it. And then suddenly you've got all your, you know, the nice diagramming and, and you can then even, you know, make changes to the, the table structures there. So it is what I think it, to me, it is one of those big areas that's a gap in, in the dataverse tooling is, is the, the object modeling, the table modeling uh, story. Yeah. And you can see you know, the number of tools in XRM toolbox, you know, trying to fill that gap. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You think that they're, they're so close, I think, with what they got in TDS endpoint now. Um, it just feels like they could just add those little bits extras and it could unlock so much more, I think. Mm. And being able to make changes, that would be even better. You know, if, mm -hmm. I, could, if I could actually use those tools, so a lot of those tools, even like in Visual Studio, yeah, you can, I can add a table and then I can add a column and I can define the data type. You know, if that, if that was unlocked, suddenly, Dataverse really would be so much easier to manage your metadata because you're just treating them like tables and columns. Yes, it's like using it as if it's just a basic SQL Server, but with all the extra cool stuff that it can give us on top. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, uh, what about handling choices? Like choices isn't <laughs> a uh, isn't a SQL concept. Like, so how would you even? I don't. Know, there, it works a lot of the basic out of the box things, but other things that it, it doesn't. So, but. Uh, yeah, that's a fun yeah. idea. But you know, you you, you can imagine a, 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 somehow the metadata for choices just being another reference table. You know, you just have a yeah a, a table that's your choices, and you know, I, I can imagine that. But I can also imagine a perfect world, <laughs> a world without hate, a world without fear, <laughs> and then I can picture us attacking wow. that world because they'd never expect it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a deep thought. Oh, I just Jack came Andy. on a more of a yeah <laughs> a philosophical slant to the podcast now. Yeah. <laughs> well, Mark, um, what's uh, maybe, maybe let's hit maybe the the number one feature, maybe the top two, two or three features that you've added that people are going to want to go get and grab and download like today um, with this new version versus the previous version before we wrap it up here. Um, so the things that you can do now that you couldn't do before um, that I've seen a lot of people asking for unions. Um, um, sub queries, probably the, the two big ones that stand out for me. Now, is this pretty much like anything outside of whatever is going to kill your data performance, like ability, or is it just like a subset um, of, you can do some unions, so you can do some sub queries. It, so you can do all unions. Um, unions are relatively straightforward. Sub queries are absolutely bloody crazy. Um, so I'm doing my best on it. Um, there are some bugs in that at the moment, which will be fixed hopefully by the time this goes out. Um, you can do some crazy stuff in SQL that I'm not going to attempt at the moment. Uh, I, I've told myself before, I'm never going to attempt that. And then I, I, a few months later, I've, I've got too obsessed with, this has got to be possible somehow. Um, <laughs> like an addiction, the moment I'm saying. Uh, it, yes. sounds, it sounds like there's a little bit of addiction going on there. Oh, yeah, there's, uh, there. <laughs> there's a little bit of, I can't let this defeat me. Um, but equally, you know, SQL Server must have a massive team that's invested hundreds of person years on it. Um, and there's no way it's going to get there. So I, I, I've got to know when to call it quits. Uh, it just, I haven't figured out how to do that yet. Um, so yeah, those, those are the, the two big ones, I think for me, um, that's should unlock more features for, for people wanting to use that today. Um, mm -hmm. What I would say from, you, know, you was mentioning before, Scott, about that um, Power BI report about you know how many people are using it. I can also see how many queries are failing on it. So I can see when things aren't working. And so far, I think I've, you know, there's a good few things that aren't quite right at the moment, but I've only had like two or three people actually reach out to me. So. Yeah, we were saying before about people not rating tools. And we want people to, 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 you know, go and give some love to the tools that are working. But equally, you know, if things aren't working, then I think most of the tool authors would like like that feedback as well. 
you know, if rather than just give up on a tool because you don't find it working or just silently hope that it will start working at some point. I think most tool authors would like to hear that feedback and understand what it is because you know, we put out tools assuming you know, we've done our testing, we're quite happy with them working, but people will go and do some stuff that we haven't anticipated. So yes, go and give the ratings when stuff works, but also give some feedback when it's not working so we can make things better as well. So uh, last question, this is for both of you. Um, as a two-part question. Have you uh, heard of Tangi's new uh, Dataverse SDK extensions? And are you planning on contributing anything to it? I have heard of them. Uh, I've seen them. And I've probably got a few that I can dust off. Um, okay. There's The problem is that they're all written for work, and I don't own the copyright and stuff that I write for work. So that's a, a different conversation. But yeah. <laughs> Copyright should not be right. No. <laughs> so, yeah. Keeping your day job is kind of an important thing, um, especially when you're not. Oh, yeah. Doing, although so. it is the number eight highest rated or most rated tool in the toolbox. Probably. I, I think I've got about pesos. $40 of donations on that as well. So. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Scott, how about you? Good stuff. Yeah, I've heard, heard of them and I've, I've, I've looked at them and um, I think we're probably. Uh, like many people, you know, everyone's got their own little favorite extensions they've used. And I think a lot of the minus probably very similar. And I don't probably, sh I'm not really sure I've got much to contribute. Maybe I've got maybe a couple of maybe extension me methods around merging plugin images, maybe I could add. But yeah, yeah they're, they're good though. It's a good idea because it's, it's a sh sharing, it's a new get package where it code sharing. So you can just bring the new get in and it'll bring in those files. Um, I'm not even sure how they're distributed yet. Is that how they're supposed to be distributed? I think that's what it's planning on doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So you basically just add the new get and it just adds those, those extension methods to your. Yeah, uh, that was my assumption, but I hadn't seen him do that. And I have an issue out there of, Hey, how, how are you, how are you expecting to go through and distribute that? So, but he's kind well, of copy and paste other stuff. Just, yeah, that was that it's was co my... copy and paste. That's 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 basically you know that's really what it is. I mean, even if you're doing a new get kind of code sharing, it's effectively yeah. just a fancy copy and paste, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I, I did add my. I have some two string debug methods that basically just kind of converts entities to JSON, which is really helpful when you're like debugging, like what is this entity or what's this entity collection, and then you can look at it a lot easier in the in the debugger, or if you want to spit it out in the and the plugin uh, trace logs. So that was one thing I added, but I tell you, when you add something to a public repository like that, it's kind of a gut check of, ooh, um, this isn't very good, or this this needs to be improved, or this, I need to tweak this, or I need to add this, or yeah. So so that was uh, that was kind of funny. I added just a few methods of, like I had a, a git name ID for entity reference, but just, it will give you the name, and then like parentheses ID, but if the name's not there, it would just give you a blank space. And then I was like, no, I don't want a blank space with, with in front of that parentheses. I, I just, want to have just the ID because there's no name associated to it. So I had to go back and add that before I checked that in. So, but anyway, so for, for those listeners that are out there, um, there is a dataverse.sdk.extensions um, that is um, out there on GitHub. I guess it's under Power Platform Patterns and Practices. Many really, uh, let's hope we don't change any names here in, anytime soon or <laughs> else that's really going to, that's really going to go the way of the buffalo. But anyway, um, <laughs> Mark, Thanks for joining us. Thanks for all the time and effort put into the uh, SQL for CDS. Uh, I, sometimes I, I think of, well, this would be really cool. This would happen, but it's I just it's going to take too much time. Um, whatever part of me that that I have in that, I don't think you have in you because you just went ahead and did it anyways. <laughs> so I, I congratulate you on, on figuring out how to do that, and congratulate you on on being a newly minted MVP. Um, Scott and I will talk to you afterwards about certain hazing rituals we'll require you to go through, <laughs> and, um, and uh, on that sort. But uh, Mark, if people want to get a hold of you and get a hold of uh, and let you know on uh, any suggestions or or just words of encouragement on on thank yous for for your tools, how can people do that? Uh, yeah, so uh, Twitter and LinkedIn, I'm uh, Mark MPN, uh, GitHub, same again. Um, you get me through the, leave a review on the XRM Toolbox site. Um, get any issues, uh, add them onto the, uh, onto the GitHub, uh, Mark MPN slash SQL for CDS. Um, stick a comment on my blog, markharrington.dev, 
Um, I don't care how the feedback comes in. Lots of channels, they all get to me. <laughs> He's an omni-channel developer. That's nice. Scott, oh, yeah. how do people get hold of us? <laughs> well, Daryl, funny, funny, you should ask that. Um, so you can email us at cast at xrmtoolbox.com. Uh, we'd love to hear uh, from you. And uh, also on Twitter and uh, LinkedIn, give us a shout out at xrmtoolcast. <laughs> Good job. Thanks. Thanks. Well, Mark, <laughs> thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks for sharing your tools. Appreciate your tool, your tool. I um, appreciate it. And congratulations again at being MVP. Thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, all the best to you, Ines. I hope to see you again on one of these sometime soon. Yep. Hope to see you at Summit next year. See how that goes too. All right. Yeah. See you guys. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>